Well, everybody, it's great to have you here with us tonight. My name is Laura. I am the current president of the Contemporary Acapella League. I'm so glad you've carved out an hour to join us tonight to hear what Charlie has to say. Um, I'm going to ask, and I believe all of you have done this already, you've all muted your device. Um, so if you've not done that, but really you all have, so I'm not even going to bother getting into that, but stay muted until the end. And we are going to save some time toward the end to uh, give you an opportunity to answer some questions. Um, as we have shared online, this is being recorded um, so that folks who weren't able to join us tonight are able to use this as a resource later on. And I think that is all I have to say. So Charlie, it is all you. I'm going to mute myself now. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. All right, guys, welcome. Thank you to the Contemporary Acapella League for having me. Um, I, I didn't, wasn't quite in the scene, uh, the post-collegiate scene when um, the Contemporary Acapella League was incepted, but uh, it was shortly thereafter. And uh, my, main, uh, my main personal group, Euphemism, has been a member of Cal since, I think the very beginning, is that right, Amanda? Yeah, and so uh, really happy to be here, thank you. So, um, we're going to be talking a little bit about recording at home tonight, and it's a two-parter series. Tonight is audio, and then next week is going to be video by Amanda, who's in the Contemporary Acapella uh, window. Um, and just to introduce myself a little bit for no one who has, uh, you know, run into me before, uh, my name is Charlie Friday. I have been <clears throat> uh, singing my whole life, uh, started in acapella in high school majored in opera in college, went up through master's level studies on that, uh, found myself pulled back into the acapella world after college, um, couldn't stay away, and uh, sort of uh, through many circumstances developed into my career, um, at least until COVID happened. And uh, we're, still, we're still chugging though. And um, uh, some things that I've worked on um, in the past several years, um, I've been a performer, the whole time uh, an educational group called Snow Day. Uh, I was the sound designer and lead engineer for uh, Disney's Decapella for most of their run in 2018-2019. Um, I designed the U.S. tour. Um, I was the designer and tour, uh, tour engineer for Acapella Live by Columbia Artists. Um, I've mixed, not in the same year, both Farsi Vocals finals um, in some capacity. Uh, I've taught acapella, um, toured all over the world, so I hadn't been recording all this stuff. So um, just really, really excited to be here. And we're going to start off. Um, remember, save your question. Uh, you can put your questions in the chat and we'll get to them. We'll leave plenty of time for that at the end. Um, hey, Hodges. How are you guys doing? Um, OK, so the first thing I want to talk about is we're, we're in this, this unprecedented time. And one of the things I think that a lot of people get caught up with when they're recording acapella is making it really, really like professional sounding and good. And right, right now we're going to talk, you can go as crazy as you want. You can buy, you know, crazy amounts of equipment. Um, but we're going to go all the way to the other end of the spectrum and talk about like what the minimum you need to get a functional recording going. Uh, and the great thing about it is as opposed to like 10 years ago, everyone has a solid, recording device in their house or hand. Um, this little thing is your gateway to making a song. And the mics on here are actually pretty good. We're gonna get more into that in a minute. But um, I just wanted to, first thing we wanted to keep in mind is that recording is supposed to be fun, okay? We need music now more than ever. And I encourage you, no matter what angle you take out of this, please remember to keep the fun in the recording process. This is, essentially for most people what we're going to be looking at is this taking the place of a rehearsal or the place of a concert for people during this time um so now that we've we've gone through that uh it's really um this is really a way to keep a group going during this time because uh, we can't have rehearsals and i know that um amanda has been a part of several projects in our house for recording we've, we've done some stuff so it's really fun and it's it's not rehearsal but it's it's the best thing we can do right now so um 
the couple basics uh you want to find a place in your house that's quiet i know with everyone home right now that can be a little challenging sometimes um preferably when you're recording your parts i know since we're all computer focused right now it's it's easy to just sit down in front of your computer and try to record but standing up will net you a much better uh much better product um you know we always said everyone's been inquired with like stand up you guys are being lazy um and the one sort of geographical thing we want to watch out for is when you're recording, um, a lot of us have put our desks in a corner in our house. I, my desk right now is in a corner. You don't want to be singing right into a corner or singing right into a flat wall in front of you. Try to have a little bit of space in front of you while you're recording, and that'll, that'll improve the sound quality a lot. Um, we're going to talk a lot about, uh, we're going to talk a lot about technical things pulled down to like a very like friendly level. Um, but what I, this is a lesson I learned from Deke Sharon many years ago. Uh, and I like to reinforce it every time I talk about recording. Um, but with a slightly different tilt. So there is no button in the recording technical process for emotion and energy. There's no way to add that. The only way you can get that is by generating it yourself. Um, that is a way normally when you're recording an album to say you know don't worry about uh you know being completely on pitch on that note because if you got good energy that's that's great and we can fix it in post well we're going to talk about not fixing it in post and actually like trying to get the best take you can possible without having to get mired in the weeds of post-production um so remember but or do remember to put energy in everything if you're feeling it then it doesn't matter if it is being recorded on a ten thousand dollar microphone or on your cell phone the energy will will come through um, and while we're talking about on that point, um, we have the time, a lot of us have a lot of extra time right now. You have the time to do more takes if you don't get it right. Um, we're going to approach this from a, we're not going to be editing and tuning a whole lot. So you really, you know, instead of knocking that out in 10 minutes and calling it done and say, they'll fix it in post, like try to get it a really good take. You, we've done, we've worked on several recordings um, in the past six months where they weren't edited and the uh, performers really took, you know, an extra half hour, extra hour to make sure their parts were as good as they could get them. And um, the results were really good, even with, with minimal or no editing. Um, Cause we're, we're assume we're going to assume right now that we have a budget of zero and we'll, we'll gradually tick that up over the course of the, this process as options, but we're baseline is zero budget. Um, and then I do want to, the um, DIY method of this is, it is feasible. Um, I know that there have been over the last seven or eight years, because, you know, we've all seen it, there have been sort of like gear escalation among the, the acapella uh, recording community as people have invested in their careers and, and people have started doing this for their career as opposed to just a side gig people have re-upped and reinvested in their businesses and their talent and a lot of the guys out there have really 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 nice uh microphones it's not necessary um and i like i got his permission to share this story but james cannon who's based out of boston he's one of the uh original notorious uh acapella producers he got his first uh, Boca track uh, right after he was in college and he mixed it on a garbage PC with the bottom, I think it was like the $40 version of Sonar and then included uh, effects and stuff on that. And he was mixing it on like $10 Logitech laptop speak, like that like bookshelf speakers for like a desktop. It's possible. You've just got to have the passion and you've got to have the, you know, the ability to like look past the equipment. I mean, equipment makes it easier, but especially when you're when you're starting when you're when you're starting out or trying something the first time. I think too much equipment and too nice of equipment. There's a downside to it because it can get really tweaky, and you can make stuff like a really nice microphone can sound amazing, but it can also sound horrible. <laughs> so, like if you don't use it right, that's the they're like scalpels. So, um, while we're talking about microphones, we're going to get. I'm sorry about my notes here. Um, we're going to go into, we've got three tiers of equipment right now. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen, actually. We're going to have a lot of interactive stuff happening today. Um, so with equipment, I have devised for this class three tiers of equipment. So the first one, the first tier we're going to talk about is 
Um, actually, okay. First thing we're gonna talk about is where you're using everything is something that is either free or something you already have. So we're gonna talk microphone being your smartphone and then um, your recording program for Windows, you'd use Audacity. And I'm gonna have a resource guide that we'll have uh, with all links to all these um, afterwards. Audacity is a free audio recording program. And then GarageBand for Mac. You can also use Audacity on Mac. Um, GarageBand is a really great tool and it comes with every Mac, even if it's not on your Mac when it comes, it's sitting there in your account and you can download it for free. Um, now, you might ask, but I have an SM58 at home from when I was in my acapella group or I was in a band or I have a guitar at some point and don't use that. The microphone on uh, your smartphone is much better for what we're doing than an SM58. An SM58 is a dynamic microphone, which is designed for live use. And the type of microphone in a smartphone is a condenser mic, which is the same type of microphone that we use in recording studios. Uh, there are also you know, live condenser microphones, but this, this will provide a much better workable sound um, using your smartphone. So that's tier one. Tier two, we're going to talk about a couple options. We're still going to be staying in the realm of free software, but we're going to talk about some USB microphone options. So here we're on Amazon and I just searched for USB microphone and there's a lot. And a lot of these are garbage. Um, I'm not going to lie to you. So the, the ones that are $45, these are probably perfectly great. Great option. I'd steer away from the ones that are $28. Those are not going to do you too well. Um, so these all look like your traditional studio microphone. Um, they'll plug right into your computer. If you're going to be in a situation where um, you'd like a better microphone, um, this isn't a huge expenditure. Um, these are not super sturdy, so I wouldn't recommend them for our little mail care package recording thing that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but they are a good option um about 30 bucks if you are into podcasting at all or you know a podcast hopeful you can get um a blue microphone where are they blue is a brand of microphone and those are a little bit higher quality um and a little bit they reject ambient noise a little bit more which is really good um they are a little bit dryer so like the blue yeti is a real popular one the blue snowball um, these are all fantastic microphones they sit about 75 to 90 dollars um, but if you ever want a microphone this this is this could be your one-stop shop for a lifetime microphone so um and then you can pair that with a uh a, a, the audacity and garage band that we were just talking about now um another option is you could have a traditional microphone and a usb interface um, which is this thing, it has a micro, you know, these little pieces of equipment have a microphone in, um, they'll take any type of normal studio microphone. This might be great for a college group that has access to studio microphones through their college, maybe they can check them out for the semester, um, but maybe don't have an interface or, or the audio interface from the school is, is built into a desk and they can't take it out or there's a bunch of different options. So for this one, I would actually, if you're gonna go this route, I would always recommend any of these Focusrite Scarlet ones. They're the red ones, <laughs> okay? Just to be simple, simple about it. Um, there's a lot of options. Again, a lot, don't get these ones that look like mixers. That's, you don't need that. Um, these little red ones are fantastic. They're really sturdy. Um, Amanda and I have been run, I think we have like six of these in Clear Harmonies and we, I mean, we've got two of them out mailing around right now for an Acaville project, and they're really sturdy and really great to use. Um, however, there is a third option, and I really like this option, um, and this is presuming that you have, you know, a little bit of a budget. So you can go with a USB microphone that is a little bit higher quality from one of the major microphone manufacturers, like Audio-Technica. Now this microphone, actually, I've got this microphone a few years ago when I was touring with Disney. Um, one of the Disney artists is also a big voiceover has a, has a fairly established voiceover artist and we were recording him like while we were at venues and stuff sometimes. And we picked up one of these. When this was released, it was about $500. So seeing that Amanda and I just noticed this was down at 149. This is a fantastic mic. It's basically got a really nice uh, entry level Audio Technica studio mic on the top half. And then the bottom half is a USB interface that's equivalent to and sonic quality to one of these Scarlet interfaces. So this is a really great option. You could get this in a nice little hard case and mail it out 
uh, mail it around for your group if that's that's an option you want to do. And then the third option is, you know, if you have access to real studio equipment, you're welcome to use that. If you already have Pro Tools um, or Logic or, you know, one of those other, one of the professional level DAWs, if you've never used them before, I would really recommend not going that direction. But if you have it and you, you, you know, someone in your group has used them for projects or you get, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of options there. There's some complications with that, which we'll get to in a minute, but that's always a good option as well. Um, all right, so now that we've covered equipment, um, we're gonna go back. So now we're gonna talk about uh, a couple quick things that have to do with how you're gonna record. And we're, gonna, we're just gonna go through this whole thing assuming that we're gonna be using a smartphone for a recording, okay? So first of all, I'm gonna do a video demonstration. When you have your smartphone and you're recording it, it's actually best to not hold it while you're recording it because then you get this happening microphone you get really excited the microphone's moving all over the place so make a stack of books put it on top of the books have the the microphone part aiming at you be good to go um now what is essential and amanda's going to touch a little bit on more on this next week with video um if you're doing an audio recording and you're using your smartphone it is very important that you not record a video to record audio okay that's, that is like the single most important thing I could tell you the entire night. Um, every smartphone has an audio, it's usually called like voice memo on, on Apple iPhones, or I think it's like voice recorder on Android, or there's a bunch of different ones, only audio. Um, and the reason for that is, is that smartphones are really smart now. And when you record a video, it will use something called variable frame rate. And that's the most technical I'm gonna get tonight. Um, that means that it's changing. Most of our video that we consume is 60 frames per second. Movies are 24 frames per second. Um, when this is recording, because it's also in the background, you usually have, you know, Facebook and Instagram and TikTok or whatever open on your phone behind it. It's still updating those in the background and it's tracking your position and, you know, whatever else is doing while you're recording the video. So if there's a spike in uh, processor usage, it's gonna crank the frame rate down a little bit, not a lot, a little bit of the video you're recording. Now what that means is that instead of a steady 60 frames per second, your phone is recording at a frame rate that's going like this the whole time. And if the video is going like that, the audio is also going like that. And so what that means is that when you put it into a program uh, like GarageBand or Audacity, it's gonna view that as um, a different, like everything's gonna be stretched out a little bit differently because it's trying to make sense of the variable frame rate because most professional tools or even Audacity, which is modeled after a professional tool, don't understand variable frame rate because it's a consumer technology. Um, so, but there's an easy solution for that. If, that. if that happens accidentally, there's this program called Handbrake. This is the most amazing program ever. It will convert all sorts of audio and video into all sorts of other audio and video. So you throw your video in here and you can extract the audio in here. There's tutorials and stuff, but you want to throw your, if you record on your iPhone accidentally, <laughs> go in here and you change this from variable frame rate to constant frame rate, and you can just make it 60. Um, and then, uh, and spit it out, and then you'll have a workable, um, workable thing there. So um, the other thing that I recommend is that when we pick our, we're going to be working in Audacity today, which is this program. Um, again, this is free. But when you decide on what you're going to do with your audio project, um, it's best to have everyone record in the same program. That will use net the, the best results. So if everyone happens to have a Mac, go for GarageBand if you want. Audacity also works on Macs. It's super simple, easy to use. Um, and then um, that way you're going to have, it's going to be much easier to parse when you're dealing with all these files at the end of the process. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is how to sync everything together. So there's a couple ways to do this. Sync is going to be the thing that makes or breaks any DIY recording project because you're not all singing together. We've all probably tried to sing happy birthday to somebody at this point over Zoom and how well does that go, right? Not good. <laughs> Everyone ends up at, at different times. So um, <clears throat> there's a couple ways to do this. One is with Finale or whatever program you've done your arrangement in. If you have a written arrangement and you, you happen to have access to the files, um, what you can do, um, and I think that you can hear this now, 
But um, so this is an arrangement that Euphemism does. Amanda and I did this uh, several years ago. But let's just listen to the to the beginning of it real quick. Okay, so if we just dumped this out into an audio file, which is really easy to do, you can go over here and export, you know, export a, you know, if you want to export an audio file, you can do that. There's no lead in time. So there's no person going one, two, three, four at the beginning to like have everyone start at the same time. So essentially, if you were just to dump this and put it in Audacity and try to record something, you would hit go and it would already be playing the first note before you could even take a breath, right? So what we're going to want to do, and this is the option one of doing this, is we're going to go into Finale and we're going to add, it's been so long, <laughs> add measures. Okay, we're going to add a measure. Where'd it go? Of course it didn't do that. Insert measures. Okay. One. There we go. Okay, we're going to add a measure at the beginning. All right, now, again, we don't have a like, we don't have a click going or anything like that. And that's not really necessary, honestly. And uh, really for DIY, I wouldn't really recommend using a click unless you really feel like you need to because that's gonna bleed in through things much worse. Um, so what we can do is we'll just find the keynote, which in this case is C sharp, right? And we're just gonna go like, oops. So you know there's gonna be four notes in tempo right before the song starts, right? So now we've got Right, so that gives everyone like a couple seconds to get together before they start recording. And even though the first time you play this, you're probably going to screw the entrance up second or third time, you'll get, you'll get it right there. Um, the other alternative is if like, say you have, say barbershop groups often are using learning tracks or guide tracks um, that are made by their directors or made by the arranger. Um, Cause a lot of barbershop people don't use sheet music. Um, one thing that you can also do Audacity, when you're doing that, is you can in, make a file like this and insert it at the beginning of your recording. And just as long as it's consistent uh, before you send it out to the group, it'll be fine. So we're going to get rid of this. We'll just record it real quick. Oh. Recording start. One, one, two, three, breathe. Okay. And so you'll hear that before you'll, and then you'll start your recording like right, right here. Um, just drop your files right there. And then you make that into a file that you send out. But even though there's no click, what you're doing is you're setting up that measure. You're giving people that time, that tempo to get synced up and have everyone start in the same note. Um, you see people clapping a lot. That's really for video. That's really for syncing between video and audio. That's not really to sync a bunch of different audio tracks together. Um, and again, we're talking like we're not having any video involved in this process at all. Um, so that's, that's two of those questions. Um, and then the other thing you want to pay close attention to is down here in the bottom, um, there's this called project rate right here, okay? So it's set to 44.1. That's what CDs, that's, this is the sort of, this is the, uh, the rate at which the recording is sampled essentially, but it, basically this is the, the, the quality of your recording. Now, most, online web videos are played at 44.1 or lower. So 44.1 is a completely legitimate way to play these. But when you're recording, you wanna make sure you've agreed upon what you're gonna be using beforehand and everyone use the same one. Because if you don't do this, when you go to put it in another program to do the mixing at the end of it, everything will end up stretched out. Just like we were talking about with the variable frame rate earlier, it, everything will be a little off. If you have some people on 44.1 and some people on 48, um, just best to pick one. It doesn't really matter. You don't need to go crazy. You know, 44.1 or 48 is fine. Um, all right, and I, I do encourage everyone to use the same, uh, the same program. Um, now, another option for programs, and we're gonna get into this here in a second, is called Reaper. Reaper is like, so you have, you have, you know, OS X for Mac and you have Windows for PCs. Reaper is like the Linux, which is like this other open source operating system of recording programs, okay? And it's at reaper.fm and it is a free 60 day trial. Now, um, if you wanna purchase it, it is only $60 
and that gives you a perpetual license forever. Um, this is a great investment because this is a professional level recording program for when you, when you get to mixing, when we get to mixing in a minute. But this is a great thing. Um, if you want to buy a piece of software, please don't buy Pro Tools. Pro Tools is a, um, is a framework more than it is a fully featured recording program. Um, if you have access to Logic, great. Logic's fantastic. Reaper is awesome. The difference between Reaper and Logic and Pro Tools is that Reaper and Logic come with a lot of really good effects, like your, your equalizers and your compressors and your reverbs and delays and stuff are really quality in there. In here, Pro Tools is basically like a shell, and the the stock effects in Pro Tools, while they do work, are kind of not really good because they're assuming that no one's going to use them, but they put them in there just so to have the feature available. Um, so you're you're really you really have to. It's it's like a compounding thing, like. Um, you know, if you if you're going to use Pro Tools, you really have to spend like another thousand dollars on top of that to get decent effects, which we don't want to do. We're talking about you know low budget as possible. This is a fully featured program. It's got a lot of really great stuff. I wouldn't use this for recording, but this is a great tool for whoever is going to assemble your recording to get something going. Um, there's lots of great tutorials for this on YouTube, uh, which I'll, I'll link to a couple of the series. But this is a fantastic entry level DAW that is as fully featured as any of the industry standard DAWs. Um, what DAWs is a recording program. Um, but for recording itself, Audacity, you can't go wrong. It's super easy um, to do that, adding tracks, everything. And this is fully documented and, and it's really lightweight. It'll, it'll run on anything. Um, so that would be what I'd recommend. Now, we're going to talk about the elephant in the room here, and that's editing. So there's really no way around. I mean, all of our well, first two things. One, the Varsity vocal stuff, which I know some of you are here for, um, which is the Bo uh, ICHSA, ICCA, and the Open. You're not allowed to hire anyone to edit and mix your stuff. It either you have to do it in the group. Um, but I think that so editing editing is something. The way that we edit acapella in the production community is something that does not translate to any other part of the music industry. Like mixing, like the way I would mix pentatonics or the way that like an instrumental guy would mix pentatonics in the studio is pretty much the same using the same techniques. There's a few things here or there that are slightly different, just like, but it's the difference between how I'd mix a bass guitar for jazz versus how I'd mix a bass guitar for rock. It's just a different genre. Um, but the way that we use melod, like the tuning programs, the primary one, which is Melodyne, is very unique. No one really outside the acapella community gets how we're doing it. It's all been kind of developed internally. And the problem is, is that um, the learning curve on how to edit stuff at a high degree is hundreds of hours, um, which if you're going into this as your full-time career, you know, 400 hours to learn how to do something is a couple months of 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week. If you're chipping away at this, you know, 45 minutes every couple of days, that's a really long time. Um, so, um, for those who are not talking about the varsity vocals bubble right now, um, if you're going to spend money, if you want editing, it, it's way cheaper and less hassle just to hire someone to do it. Um, it's not required. You can spend that extra time, get some good takes. It'll still sound amazing. Um, but the, I would not recommend buying Melodyne and trying to learn how to edit. And that's not, I'm not trying to gateway this process. It's just, it's, it takes so long. I don't even do it anymore. I taught um, Ellie, who's our uh, recording engineer for Clear Harmonies. Like I understood how to do it and how we wanted it to sound. And I sort of gave her guidance and then she went and practiced for several hundred hours. And now she's way better than I could have ever, <laughs> could ever be at editing and anything that we have editing needs to go to her um, within the company. But it's just, it's one of those things like it's just, you have to live it to to do it and it's really hard to do that as a as a hobbyist um and i'm not trying to be discouraging you know if you want to look look into it go for it also melodyne is like 600 dollars as well so you know if this is a piece of software that you're going to be using 40 hours a week for the next 20 years of your life it's worth the investment but if you're just trying to do a recording of your group for fun not worth it um now mixing is another thing i don't think uh, especially if we're talking about um so again, we're gonna we're gonna start off by saying we're not talking about the varsity vocals bubble, and then we'll jump to varsity vocals bubble. Um, 
when we're recording, you, this doesn't, ha I mean, we're going to talk about how to share this stuff, but it doesn't have to be shared outside of the group. You could make a recording with your group as like a project and just have it to have it. You don't need to put it on social media. You don't need to put it on YouTube or release it. Um, especially right now when, when we're trying to find any way to, to connect with each other. Um, I was telling Amanda earlier, um, the barbershop chorus that she's in, they were working on a recording thing. And I'm like, you know, you could just turn that on and sing the song with them and feel like you're at rehearsal a little bit. <laughs> and I think that's a valid use for these kind of recordings. It's just, you, you come together and you have a recording of your friends that you love singing with. And, you know, you can turn it on and sing a couple of your favorite songs along with them and feel like you're maybe, it's not quite like rehearsal, but it may be the closest thing we can get to it right now. Um, so mixing, I think there's, you know, there's certainly ways to do it better and ways to do it less better, but like, there's no wrong way to do it. It's all about taste and aesthetic. Um, and as opposed to editing, there's, there's like, right, you can mess things up and have it like not sound really good. I think with mixing, if you just have a light touch with everything, don't do anything too drastic. Um, it's really easy to get the basics going, um, really quickly. And you, you know, who's, you define your own sound. Um, you, there's no standard for it. You don't have, you know, this, there's no bar to measure against for this kind of thing. So I would encourage you to explore mixing and, and Reaper is a great way to do that. Um, GarageBand also has, has developed into a much more user-friendly tool. It's kind of, uh, Logic is the, the pro version of GarageBand and Logic has kind of come closer to GarageBand and GarageBand's taken stuff from Logic. So it's actually a much better program than it was a few years ago. Um, And, and again, like, so say you're, say you have like, just, just talking brass tacks right here. Um, and varsity vocals stuff, like, you know, go for it. If you want to edit it, you want to buy the program, like there's, you know, people out there that can help answer your questions. Um, if you have any budget, uh, it's cheaper to hire someone to edit two songs for you than it is way cheaper than to just buy Melodyne. Um, and they'll get it done way faster and way better than, a, a DIY person. Editing is not really like a DIY skill. Editing, it just takes a really long time to learn to have anything that's even usable. Um, but, um, you know, at, at the outset, I think the important thing to learn is if you're the person that's organizing this and you're the person that's going to assemble the final product, don't get frustrated. Um, there's, there's no, it's all about aesthetic. I've mixed stuff that I've loved for my groups that pretty much everyone we played for <laughs> hated, but we loved it. And so it was for us. And, um, and the same thing, I've mixed stuff that I didn't like that everyone else loved. So it's just one of those things like there is, it's, it's art. Remember, you know, there's, there's really, if you're happy with it, um, you know, that's the thing. And, you know, again, if you're starting this, it's, a, and you're getting frustrated, remember that like, you know, Amanda and I have been doing this for God, 20 years, more than that. I still don't like a lot of the work that I do because I see all the imperfections. So just because you, you feel like something's not good, you know, play it for, play it for your family. You know, you have a rough draft, play it for your partner, or play it for your kids, see if they like it. Because a lot of times you get so close to this material that it's really hard for you to take a step back and see how good it actually does sound because you've worked with it from, you know, you brought it up from a little baby song to a fully grown song and it, you see all the bumps and bruises along the way. And, um, my, uh, one of my, my recording mentors, Bill, he said, you know, it's like, it's like having kids, you know, I look at my kid and I, I see, you know, I see her when she broke her wrist and I see her, you know, I, I know that she has a scar back there, even though it's under her shirt and I can't see it from when I wasn't paying attention enough when she was five or whatever. But like, so you see all that, but you know, someone meeting his daughter doesn't see that. They just see, the final product, the final person, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, this is the only time I'm gonna say this. Um, and I think we're, we're nearing the end of my presentation. We can start doing some questions. But um, if you have a budget right now, consider supporting one of the acapella engineers in the community. Uh, the pandemic has laid waste to the arts and especially hard hit have been the technical people the technical workers in the arts um while a lot of the acapella people are doing okay um a lot of full-time arts technicians are 
in <clears throat> in like a really bad way right now. And so if you do have any, you know, any budget for production, and again, not Farsi vocals, obviously, I realize you guys can't do this, but um, for the, those of us that are just doing like projects with our Cal group or something like that, you know, consider, you know, hiring an editor or something. I mean, that might, that $200 might make a huge difference right now uh, for someone. Um, and again, I can't emphasize enough. It, 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 the, not, these things don't have to be products. They don't have to be commercial products. They can be just something that you enjoy. They can be something that you love and put out on YouTube or Facebook to share with people. And we're singing because we love it and we're singing because it's fun. And the recording process, although complicated, can be super fun. Um, some of the most fun I've ever had with my groups are have been recording. Um, it's just a great, there's, there's nothing quite like it. And um, yeah, so um, I think I see the chat is blown up like crazy. So I think we have like a lot of questions. So I think, do we want to get over to the questions, Laura? Okay. Would you mind just feeding them to me in order of most relevance? Oh, totally. Now that I have unmuted myself. <laughs> All right. Let me look at this here. I want to stop sharing my screen unless we need to. So we need to do that again. And welcome all you people who have joined. All right, going back up, I'm just going to read them down in order for you, Charlie. Oh, sure, go for it. And I'm gonna, on the research resource sheet, like I'm on Facebook as Charlie Friday. If you have any questions, just hit me up. I'm, I'm available. I mean, I've, I know several of you, but like, I'm very friendly. Um, I help people all the time with, with questions and, and a lot of the stuff that <clears throat> you guys might have questions about is, is or they're really quick to answer. Um, so don't, don't feel like you're imposing. If, if I don't have time to answer you right, then I'll tell you and get back to you later. Um, but I'm not scary very much. Did we lose La Laura Stiller? Laura froze. Okay. Amanda, are we still good? Yeah. With, okay. Okay. I'm just going to start. Laura's right. going to come. Okay. So the first question is, do you have any tips to deal with room ambiance or so room noise um, and clipping when using smartphones to record? Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> room ambiance. Um, that's a great, great question. I have an answer. So first of all, clipping using smartphones, just stand a little, don't have the smartphone. Don't have it right here. Have it, you know, the same distance away, a, a regular um, I think a lot of people, because we talk on our speakerphone like this, assume that's when you record. You don't have a studio microphone like, I'm, this is not really a studio microphone, but you don't have a studio microphone like right next to your face when you do it. It's usually, you know, six, eight inches away. Um, I think if you put it up on a book, a book stack like we were talking about earlier and about, uh, about mouth level and you kind of just stand a comfortable distance away, it'll be fine. Um, so room noise. All right, so what we're going to do we're gonna hear the room noise on on this and I'm gonna show it. Oh, are we sharing? I'm not sharing my screen yet, I'm sorry. Zoom. Oh, get out my screen sharing back, Amanda. Yep, you can share again, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so Audacity has this pretty great noise reduction tool. Um, so we're gonna to listen to this. Recording start. One, one, two. Okay, so there's this thing under effect called noise reduction. Okay. Oh, sorry, I have to select. So what you want to do is you want to select the noise. <laughs> you don't want to select anything that you've recorded. You want to select, it needs a sampling of the noise it's trying to get rid of. So the, the air conditioning hum in my room right now is right there. So we select the noise, we go to effect, we go to noise reduction, we say get noise profile. It's going to analyze that. Okay. And then we're going to select the whole track. Okay, then we're gonna to go to effect and we're gonna do repeat noise reduction. And honestly, anything more than that is gonna require very specialized tools and very specialized knowledge and I wouldn't worry about it too much. And also any sort of reverby sounds, that, that'll, that'll deal with your air conditioned noise, if there's traffic, you know, if you live in New York or something and there's traffic out your window, that'll deal with that. Um, and it will automatically go through and, and cut out the blanks. Um, it's a really great tool. Um, any sort of like room reverb, it, don't worry about it. It's, I know that <clears throat> if we, again, if we were dealing with really high quality equipment and, you know, um, really, uh, 
we were we were aiming for like a you know really nicely mixed and mastered um or professionally mixed and mixed and mastered product we'd want to try to eliminate that but it doesn't really matter um there's ways to creatively layer reverb on top of that room ambiance um and not cause any issues so i think we're good with the next question <clears throat> There are deverb tools though in some of these programs, so you can try them, um, which mm -hmm. does sometimes help. And I'll get into that a little bit next week in, in the video, because um, there are some great tools in um, Adobe products that will help with yeah. that as well. Oftentimes that is a ducking gate though, which you can, which is a, a sort of dynamic open and close thing and that can start making things sound weird, but um, unless it's super extreme, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Yep. And also like Sean just said in the, in the chat, if your room really echoes blankets, and not singing into corners. A lot of that, if you can get rid of the echo to begin with, um, it's a lot easier to do it pre rather than post, especially if you're not spending money with professionals. Um, all right, let's go back up. Um, can you export the tracks from Audacity into Reaper for editing and mixing? So can you go through the process of taking Absolutely. it from a phone or Audacity and yeah. putting it into So we're gonna, we're gonna have it in Audacity right now, okay? And then we're gonna export. I'm going to export as wave or in here we'll export multiple um, and what this is going to do export multiple is going to bounce out each of these stems or actually you wouldn't be doing this because you wouldn't be recording so you're going to pick your one track that you want to do and you're just going to export and you always want to have everything exporting as a wave okay and we'll export that to my desktop and we're going to call it count in okay we don't need to do the tags. We'll go on here to Reaper. I'm not sharing my screen, am I? No, I'm not. Nope. I'm dumb. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So going back to Audacity, we're going to select the track. Select. There's a little. There's a hidden button right here that selects everything. Um, and then we're going to go to export. Export as a wave. We're going to do count in. Save it. Yeah, I know it's already. That's just the ID3. That's the tagging information. We don't need that. Um, and that'll be right there. And then we're going to come in here and we're going to import. Actually, I think you can just drag and drop. Hang on. You guys are keeping me on my feet here. Yeah, OK. So we can just drag it in here and it'll drop it right in. Um, I don't have uh, Audat Reaper won't let me play audio out of it without taking over the Zoom, um, <laughs> so I can't play that. But that's that's as simple as it is. Um, if you have a iPhone recording and it's a, like a .m4 whatever, um, you can use Handbrake, that program we were talking about earlier, to convert it to a wave. If someone sends you an MP3, convert it back to a wave. It'll save you a lot of hassle um, in the long run. Okay. All right. And if he doesn't answer the full question, go ahead and keep adding into the chat because I'm following along because Laura is on her phone. So you get to hear my voice. Laura's instead. back. Okay. So how do you get the cell phone audio to sound less like cell phone audio? Well, you <laughs> I mean, you don't really. I mean, that's one of the things that I think we're, we're talking about, like, it it will still sound like a cell phone recording. Um, now, here's a good place to talk about what we were talking about earlier, where if we have, um, we can make what, what's called a recording care package. Okay, so say you buy this microphone and you buy a little hard case for it. You can mail this around to all of your group or do porch, porch drop-offs. You know, sanitize it obviously with bleach wipes and stuff like that, but you can do porch drop-offs and everyone can use the nice microphone um, and split the cost aggregate amongst your group. Uh, I think that's a really great solution. Um, Amanda and I have been um, doing that for a couple of projects and it's working really well. And I know a few other groups that have been um, even, even in the same city that are kind of like doing a, a sort of hot potato microphone setup around. So if you have them, if you have the means to do this, by all means do it. Um, cell phones are, uh, there's a frequency chart that I will include with this for key frequencies. I'm not gonna get into, into the weed. This is kind of like a weeds mixing technique question. 
Um, but the the frequency chart that I will send out does have um, a really good explanation of what each frequency range does sonically. And the frequency range is the cell phone, cell phone boosts diction and it boosts vowel formants because that's what the microphone is designed to capture speech. And in order for speech to be intelligible, um, the sort of the plosive diction and the vowel formats, which are like the vowel sounds that we that make up our language are what frequencies that cell phones generally boost. Um, they're not really gonna be that tinny. I think the biggest problem you're gonna have is, is with the bass recording um, and the bass actually should kind of get really, you know, get a little bit closer to the microphone and not sing directly into it, kind of sing over. Um, but that's that that would be the way that um i'd recommend getting around that but a lot of them will it'll actually sound pretty good once you once you play with it a little bit get it compressed and and get some reverb on it it won't sound it won't sound like it you know thousand dollar microphone but it won't sound bad either so where do you go to can do the compression and the eq in these programs <laughs> okay great so we're gonna go in here um for effects So I actually will, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to pass on questions like this because there are YouTube tutorials that will show you, I will link um, YouTube tutorial series for Reaper and for, um, and for Audacity and GarageBand. And they are really well done and I can't recommend them enough. And they will teach you in a much better and more clear way than I will be able to show you. <laughs> I'm happy to answer specific questions about, um, the process of recording under these circumstances but if we're going to go into actual mixing technique there's more efficient ways for you guys to spend your time doing that than watching me uh, i'm not a i'm not a reaper user i'm more yeah so can you at least go through the the process the effects that we usually use in this just to kind sure. of clean everything up so they know what yeah. to look for absolutely All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. I'm still sharing my screen. So we're gonna go, so here, we're gonna go back. So basically for the effects you're gonna to wanna to use, most every channel is gonna, you're gonna click this effects button, okay? Most every channel is gonna have three effects on it. One of those is going to be an equalizer, which is EQ, okay? Double click on that. Here's your EQ parameter, it's active on the channel, okay? And you can change the parameters like this. This is something that anyone who's fooled around with the mixing board or mixing program won't know. Um, the second one you're gonna use is a compressor. That's gonna be under dynamics, okay? So I always, the real comp is the basic compressor. Now this is a really scary looking <laughs> compressor. I would actually recommend um, using a preset if you don't really know what, compressors are one of those things where you can screw it up real bad if you don't know what you're doing. Um, if you watch some videos and understand what's going on, that's fine. But um, I actually would recommend using, and I've done this for it, the background vocals compressor um, for everything but the lead. And then for the lead, you could do, um, there's a bunch of vocal presets that you could do. Or, you know, you can use, I always like presets, especially as a starting point. So modern vocal, that'll get you in the range and you can sort of play with the different parameters. Um, I could spend an hour teaching you how to use a compressor and not even hit all the points. So I'm not going to go into parameters, but there's presets in here. And then add effects for reverb. There's a couple different ways to do reverb. Um, for uh, right now, just adding these in, um, this, this wouldn't necessarily technically be the correct way to do it, but this is a, a way that is totally fine. Um, and you're gonna wanna make sure that all of your reverbs, you know, if you have a backing block and then your drums and bass and your lead, you probably want the same reverb on all the backing block and then maybe a different one on the drums and bass and then a different one on the, uh, or different settings on the lead vocal. All right. I hope that helped. Okay, let's go back up to more questions. All right. What tips would you have for those who are intending to edit and mix themselves, particularly on the mixing side? So mixing side, um, is this person in a college group or an adult? Not sure. Do we know? Can, can whoever put that question in reply Alyssa, real quick? you can unmute yourself and, and answer. 
She just responded and said college. college. Okay, so for a college group, <clears throat> I would recommend um, having a, when you're working on mixing the song, um, have a select number of people that are helping you like sort of get feedback on how the song's going. Cause if you send it out to the entire group, you're going to have 5,000 pages of notes and half the group's going to say one thing about a certain measure and half the group's going to say the exact opposite thing about that measure. So I always like to pick um, when I'm working with the college group, I recommend whoever's doing the recording, um, maybe the music director, the arranger, and then maybe the soloist or the beatboxer, depending on how the song is going um, and have them give feedback. And then once you guys feel like it's in a good place, then you can give it to the group and say, um, I always like to control the information flow or recommend controlling the information flow. Say, all right, each of you gets one comment on the song. Um, otherwise people write essays and that's not something that I would, <laughs> I would wish on anybody. And especially um, if people are listening to, oh, that reminds me, something I forgot to mention earlier. When you're mixing, do not mix on your laptop speakers, okay? Put a pair of headphones on. Even little app, crappy Apple, um, not crappy, but the little little wired Apple headphones that come with everything. You have those, that's gonna be miles better than listening to your laptop speakers. Those don't give you an accurate uh, picture of what you're listening to. Um, over the ear headphones are great. Um, and I'll have a recommendation for some inexpensive ones that are quite good. Um, editing, I, I mean, editing is like, again, the problem with editing is there's no tutorials I can point you to because as I said earlier in the in the session, like the, the way we edit for acapella is, um, <laughs> it, it's endemic to acapella. And it's sort of been uh, institutionally passed knowledge passed down for everybody. And there's plenty of people like it. And it's just not something that you can, that you can learn quickly, unfortunately. Um, what you can do is look up, you know, in Melanine, how to use a macro, um, which is sort of like an automatic tuning protocol and set it for, you know, a little bit conservatively and that will help clean up. But if you're wanting to go through and make stuff super perfect, I mean, on, you know, this is the one thing that I, I don't want to tell you not to do it. And if you have time, absolutely dive in and try, but it is, you know, the barrier to entry on the software is kind of expensive, um, several hundred dollars. And it's, it's going to take, you know, the first song I edited in Melodyne, I started over five times back when I first started using it. Um, and I think it took me like 65 hours to edit the first song that I did, which was in, you know, 2000. Or <laughs> so, um, so Charlie, yeah. if they're yes. not going to do much editing work aside from mm -hmm. taking out the room noise and, and, right. and think those kind of things, what are ways that can, um, they can coach their singers to do it in a way that they don't need as much editing? Like most of the editing process is when people are being tuned. Right or the timing is being changed so that everybody's mm -hmm. in line with each other. How can you coach your singers to um, do it right the first time? Because there's not a lot of fixing in post in these projects right now. Yeah, that's a great question. One of the ways you can do it is you can actually have someone on video chat with them while they're doing it and share the audio, um, much like we're doing, or at least you don't even have to share the, the computer audio the way we've done it tonight. You can just have them share over their webcam or whatever so the musical director or whoever's spearheading the project can hear um i think the big thing that we you know we do with all of our college groups and all of our adult groups is don't feel like you have to record the whole thing in one shot you know record the in, record the whole thing to warm up then you know say record the intro a couple times so you feel like you really got it then move on to the first verse really get that make it in manageable chunks and do them repeatedly over and over again um, that's how you, that's how you really get a really tight raw recording. It's just, uh, breaking it down and then making it, um, doing it over and over and over again with, with a little bit of a break in between, but try to keep the pacing going. So they get into a rhythm. Um, and eventually it'll, you'll get a really good take. And then you take the best verse one and the best verse two and the best verse three, um, and all stitch those together and, uh, make a really good take. And that's something a lot of times groups kind of gloss over because they want to get through it and the, the, you know, they're paying the engineer to be there and they want they have to get through in a certain amount of time. But now we have more time to spend doing that. That's how we, back when I was recording acapella in the late nineties, like that's how we did it because Melodyne wasn't, didn't exist <laughs> at that might've, even if it existed, it wasn't available to us. 
and we were working on tape and that is that's how we got a good sound which is doing it over and over again in small chunks and tying them together and then once you have that all set what um a basic mixing process can you go over what happens in that mixing process what people should be looking for and i mean i know we'll we'll post more links to youtube sure. tutorials but what so, are they doing right so basic thing um if you're if you're going for like let's call it a studio type recording. Um, I don't know what the, what the parameters for varsity vocals, can they double Amanda or is it single track nope. person? You can, you could submit whatever, whatever you want for varsity whatever you want. Okay. as long as you record it yourself. Cool. Okay. So um, basic, basic technique would be to say, um, have your, uh, have two tracks per person. Let's, let's split it up into three, three, uh, three segments. So we're going to have the rhythm section. We're going to have the soloist and lead harmonies or backing harmonies or whatever. And we're going to have all the instruments. Okay. Um, vocal percussion. There's a million ways to do it. You have a bed track, sample everything. Um, layer it over, have just samples, have just live track. There's a bunch of ways. There's no really wrong way to do it. If you think your vocal percussion sounds rad when you're done with it, then it's fine. Um, at basic, what you want to do for your vocal percussion is at minimum split it into two channels that are the same channel and mix one high and one low. So you're going to boost the high frequencies on one and boost the low frequencies on the other one. So you have independent control of like the bass drum, the bass drum sounds and the treble drum sounds. That's way oversimplifying it. Um, and then your bass is, you know, even for a lot of tracks that I work on, we have one track of bass if it's like a pop or rock song or R&B song, and that's going to be not panned. It's going to be in the middle backing tracks you're gonna have two of everybody so if you have three altos you're gonna have six tracks um you know three of linda three of amanda and three of uh elisa and you're gonna pan of each person you're gonna pan one of them left all the way and one of them right all the way and what that's gonna do is it's gonna thicken up the sound and it's also gonna give a lot of space in the middle for um your drums and your bass and your lead vocal because if you have your lead vocal in the middle and you have everyone else in the middle then it's going to like really clog up the clarity that you can get lead vocal be in the middle i like to put lead harmonies in the middle too like right on top of that and have one track of a lead harmony um and then if you have like sort of like a backing block behind like backing vocals behind them then i like to have doubles of those two but not panned out as far as the, the instruments so if you kind of think about you know visually you can kind of construct the mix with you know drums bass and then the backs are out here the leads right here lead harmonies up here and then maybe the backing vocals are like kind of around here and then reverb eq and to taste and that'll give you your basic spacing um for the mix all right um can you <clears throat> give more guidelines on eq i know you said we'll put up the thing but um just a quick one on a little bit muddy can you fix sure. Okay. Money? So we're going to go back into this channel right here. We're going to look at the EQ. Okay. Your basic. So I'm going to give you like the basic starting point for the EQ. And then obviously everyone's going to be different because everyone's voice is different. Everyone, even the same singer on different days and the same microphone, you're going to have to EQ them differently. Um, so what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to put a high pass filter. That's gonna cut off any microphone noise or any low stuff. This is for non basses and non vocal percussions, um, non beatboxers. And then you're gonna to wanna to do like a mid cut. Um, yeah, that's okay. Like a mid cut around 250 to 300, it depends. Um, that's gonna kind of get out the muddy sounds. And then for cell phones, I don't actually think you're gonna to need to boost clarity a whole lot but usually i'll have something for a normal microphone i'll have something in the range of this and then for this one i'll have like a little brightness these are kind of you kind of just have to see where it goes this is like a basic thing now one thing i do like to do for studio recordings is say like uh so you want to like 125 is like for all of the non-rhythm section people is where i'd want to start so like say you can kind of waterfall these up so say all the baritones are going to have their high pass at 125 and then the tenors are going to have 135 and then the altos are going to be at like 155 and then the supreme or, or wherever and depending on how many parts breaking down you can give a little more space but i like to give them like 30 megahertz of space where they are really the only thing living because most of our singing happens in here most of our tone 
is happening like right around in here and it gives them a little bit of space to breathe and um it'll just give be allow you to hear each voice a little bit more distinctly um and not have to worry about you know it, it won't be such a struggle to get everyone heard in the recording um now for rhythm section we're going to want to go back to the normal um eq and again for this bass actually some bases i want to have a cut like right here because they're over dictioning but it just depends there's a lot of bass technique stuff that um with bass like more relaxed is the better like not dim 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 but dim, dim, dim. You know, there's there's a, a huge difference in the quality of what you can do to the sound if there's not all that meh, meh. and I know when you're singing on campus or in a coffee shop and you don't have microphones as so many of us have done and you're the bass you have to just push as hard as you can to get any sound to travel at all but when you have the microphone and inch from your mouth like it's the tone you can get you know as I like to say yummy make it as yummy as you can as you can as the bass and then the vocal percussion will kind of be a, so this would be your your well actually I don't like to do that um because the bass doesn't need that frequency. Let's go band. It's like this is ballpark bass EQ starting point. Um, and then, and again, you also you might have to do like some pop um, correction on the bass, but really you want to nip that in the bud with technique. And then for vocal percussion, if you're going to just do one vocal percussion track. Um, something like this and we'll we would put this back to a shelf um something in that range if you were going to do a, a split um what you'd want to do is a low pass filter so like oop want to do a low pass filter and like that would be your kick drum right and then your upper parts would be like your your upper part of the drums if we turn this into a high pass would be like that and you can you can bump the snare or whatever you need to do to make the sound good but basically what that'll do there's there's an area in here that you just don't want really any vocal percussion noise happening because it's mostly just mic mic handling noise and mouth noise and stuff and so there's like uh, if you overlay those two, this would be your high track and the other one would be your low track. So that's kind of a really quick uh, overview. And you know, when you're compressing, like uh, like if you have the low bass track, like on the compressor, like do it, go in here and, and do the, you know, the, the, um, the kick preset. I mean, that's what we're trying to imitate, right? Just use the preset for kick drum, use the preset for these overheads for your upper vocal percussion as a starting point and tweak it to taste. I love presets as a starting point when you're when you're starting out for mixing. Don't be afraid of presets. They're really great like to start. And you don't have to use it, but just it's great to get in, in the ballpark. Yep. And then if you just move um, each of those numbers, the one, two, three, four, five, if you move them around, start with a preset, and then you just bump one of them up about five decibels like he's doing right there. Um, you can move it around like he's doing back back and forth and you can start to hear when it sounds good and when it starts to sound bad and when it's up that high and it sounds bad you just pull it down that's where you want to pull it down um, yeah so if yeah. you think if you think someone has like nasal in their voice you can kind of uh, this isn't the right frequency but you can kind of say okay well i'm going to put this person I'll put it up like 5 db and be like nasal nasal oh they're super nasal there okay they're less nasal and then go back oh they're really nasal there and just find that and just pull it down a little bit and that'll reduce that what you don't want your EQ to look like is this, okay? This is not a good EQ, okay? Don't don't be this person. Don't do it. All right. <laughs> Typically, five dB in any direction is more than enough. Yeah, this isn't doing anything. Like it really isn't. If you have if 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 you feel like you need to do this, there's something else going on that you need to correct. Like this doesn't EQ doesn't do anything to the volume really. It just is like a it's like a tone color control, essentially. Um, you can make things a little brighter and and but i mean you what you want to do is all of these things enhance what's already there right if you want it corrective action it happens when you're recording like if you have something like oh i really don't like how you're singing it you're just singing it too bright or too dark or too screechy or whatever like you have to fix that when they're recording especially now um these are these are like slight massages to the tone you can't really like be ham fisted with the EQ and have it still sound good. Okay. And then the last question I'm seeing in the chat, Charlie, is about dynamics. Okay. 
So uh, mostly like, volume. So how do we control the volume of the, of the tracks to make sure that dy dynamics is dynamics in terms of could we clarify? Are they talking about That'd volume Fernando, balancing? So go ahead and okay, Fernando, are we talking about volume balancing? Or are we talking about like how do you make like crescendos or make sure something's piano or forte? Uh, I believe it is the second one. Okay, uh, so that again, so volume is going to be something that we're we're controlling down here, right? This is going to be the different volumes of the tracks, which is is good for that. Um, you can automate these so they move on their own, which will create what I like to call like fake dynamics. Um, now this is different. This is different from uh, this is no. This is guys. This is not. This is not this type of dynamics. We're talking about like musical dynamics. Okay. Um, However, that always reads pretty artificial and I don't like doing that. So the dynamics have to happen when you're recording and you can make them more dramatic. Like, so if someone's doing like a crescendo, you can make a little fader move and record that fader move to automate it. Um, and it will enhance that. But to make it by itself with just a fader move, it sounds very fake. Um, that's where we go back to the beginning when, you know, the energy has to be there there's no fix there's no way to put energy and excitement and dynamism into singing that is not present already um and the microphones on smartphones are very dynamic actually these are these are actually quite uh, a engineering achievement these are really i know they're not a studio microphone or you know and they, they sound different but they are it is quite of a high quality microphone and the issue i think is that when you listen to these things sometimes you're not listening to it with the noise reduction on and the noise reduction will make it much closer to what you're you're used to sounding it is you know it is does have its own bias like we talked about it's got those certain frequencies that it's bumping um but i mean every microphone has a bias like in the tones that it captures um but i would say like you know again just like the eq you can en enhance what's there i always um good rule of thumb is when we've been recording euphemism i mean we've recorded some stuff with snow day but euphemism has been our primary recording group um that i've been a part of for you know over a decade now and what i like to do other than the vocal percussion i like to list like do you know get everything recorded throw it in uh, my my audio program sort of pan it out like i would throw a little bit of reverb on all the tracks and just listen to it raw. No EQ, no compression, um, no effects. And if that sounds good, I'm like, all right, I'm ready to start mixing. Like this sounds like the song that I want to produce. And then so you're starting from a good spot and everything. And I'm not talking about the quality of the recording. I'm not talking about the quality of the audio files. I'm talking about the performances. Um, if that's in a good spot, before you start mixing, everything you're going to do is going to help because every the, you're just enhancing what's already good about the recording. If that makes sense. Yep. And then in terms of not making it totally stressful for your singers, a lot of singers are not used to singing alone by themselves. And I think um, we've seen this now, especially with my barbershop mm -hmm. groups. They're used to singing in a big group and they're not used to singing alone into a microphone at home. And that can be really nerve wracking for people. So remind them, you get as many chances as you want on this. So try not to give your singers like a really strict deadline unless it's absolutely necessary. So, you know, and the deadline for the varsity vocals events isn't until October. Don't wait until the second week in September to start that. Get your plans together now so you're not asking people to record on a on a tight deadline. That's for professionals. Amateurs, this is fun. So make sure you're giving them enough time to do it. And then if they need gentle feedback, that you have time to give it to them and they have time to redo it um, rather than rushing it on September 30th. Something that you can also do with that as well is before you even send the tracks out to the group, get a get a, a scrap, get a rough drum tack drum take in there get a rough it doesn't have to be the final lead but get a you know get the lead in there and send those out synced up with the guide track that you're using so they hear the lead and they hear the drums and it's not just them hearing you know the piano going plink 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 um and they'll feel a lot more in trash and if you have some singers that really are nervous save them to the end i mean even if you're all recording on your own and you're not doing the recording care package um thing you know maybe say all right so you guys are, are a little bit less comfortable. I mean, we all know who the, you know, everyone's got the songs they're comfortable on and maybe not as comfortable on. Have everyone 
do it and then throw you know one person on each part into the guide track just like we just talked about with the recording with the drums and uh, and the lead and that will help immensely i don't record anything even in even under ideal circumstances i have the lead rough lead rough drums rough bass before i'd start doing any of the uh the backing parts just so they feel like they they're in the song um and not just you know a voice floating in the void um, so Charlie and I will stay on a little bit longer. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Just pipe up if I missed anything. Um, this is part one. Part two will happen at the same time next week right here. It'll likely be the same link because it's our permalink for the CalZoom account. Um, next week we'll be going over video, which um, we'll talk about importing all of this audio that you worked on this week and then some of the tips and tools that you can use um, for creating those either full-on music videos or just um, something that you can submit or just box videos. Um, and we'll also talk about how to make box videos a little bit more interesting than everybody blank staring into a Zoom conference call. Um, so if there's any other questions, we'll stay on a little bit and we'll also post this with the resource pages. Um, and hopefully those will be up in the next day or so. So keep an mm -hmm. eye on the Cal page and you guys can take those home with you. And remember, you can always follow up. You can send notes to us here at Cal, or you can send, you can reach out to Charlie directly. Either way. Um, and Amanda, can I add Go one ahead. more thing? So, um, and if you guys do end up buying any equipment or, or buying anything, um, reach out to me. I have a really great Sweetwater rep. And uh, again, like the whole music industry is suffering right now. If you order something automatically on the cart on Sweetwater, no one gets any commission, but if he helps you out, he will get a commission and I have trained him in the ways of acapella for the last 10 years and he loves it and will often recommend things that I don't think to recommend or I don't think to that I need and he reckon he's like he understands the the style enough that he can make recommendations that are really good and he's a, he's a great sales rep so hit me up for that and I'm you know Amanda you my contact information yep so you can reach Charlie at Charlie that's just c-h-a-r-l-i-e at clearharmonies.com and I'm sure that Andrew is typing that into the chat as I speak because he's really good at doing that <laughs> and then also you can reach out to us um, at the Contemporary Acapella League you can just email info at acapellaleague.org if you have questions you can also reach out to us on Facebook several of us monitor that account so we'll get back to you as soon mm -hmm. as we can and, and you, can, you, you can, can even Go ahead, Laura. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to add, you can also uh, send us messages on Instagram, too, if that's more your thing. If so. that's your thing, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm on Whatever Facebook. your thing is. <laughs> I'm on Facebook as Charlie Friday. Um, and uh, I'm happy to, if you send me a message on Facebook, friend me, too, because my messages that aren't friends go into the void. And um, I'm happy to answer questions there. I'm not really on any other social media platforms. I'm on Twitter, but I don't any music stuff on Twitter, so don't write me there, please. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else um, that people want to ask before um, we just start letting you go? Thank you so much for coming. Um, for those you of you guys. that are interested in uh, topics that uh, affect mostly post-collegiate groups, but they can expand to other types of groups as well. Cal's going to keep doing these and as long as we're all stuck inside. So if you have things that you want to learn, um, go ahead and reach out to us and we will try to put together a seminar for you. And then I'll turn it over to Laura in case she wants to close anything out. I'm just going to close one it out by time. saying <laughs> just one more close out. Uh, just thanks to all of you for uh, once again, taking the time to join us this evening. Um, we're looking forward to being a more prominent resource in our community and um, looking forward to more interaction with all of you. So again, thank you so much.